Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Today we are reading The Whisper in Darkness by H.P. Lovecraft. If you like what you hear, please make sure to subscribe. And now, on with our story time. Chapter 1 Bear in mind closely that I did not see any actual visual horror at the end. To say that a mental shock was the cause of what I inferred, that last straw would send me racing out of the lonely Ackley farmhouse and through the wild domed hills of Vermont into a commandeered motor at night is to ignore the plainest facts of my final experience notwithstanding the deep extent to which I shared the information and speculations of Henry Ackley, the things I saw and heard, and the admitted vividness of the impression produced on me by these things. I cannot prove even now whether I was right or wrong in my hideous inference, for after all, Ackley's disappearance establishes nothing People found nothing amiss in this house, despite the bullet marks on the outside and inside. It was just as though he had walked out casually for a ramble in the hills and failed to return. There was not even a sign that a guest had been there, or that those horrible cylinders and machines had been stored in the study that he had mortally feared the crowded green hills and endless trickle of brooks among which he had been born and reared means nothing at all, either. For thousands are subject to such morbid fears. Eccentricity, moreover, could easily account for strange acts and apprehensions toward the last. The whole matter began, so far as I am concerned, with the historic and unprecedented Vermont floods of November 3rd, 1927. I was then, as now, an instructor of literature at Miskatonic University in Arkham, Massachusetts, and an enthusiastic amateur student of New England folklore. Shortly after the flood, amidst the varied reports of hardship, suffering, and organized relief which filled the press, there appeared certain odd stories of things found floating in some of the swollen rivers, so that many of my friends embarked on curious discussions and appealed to me to shed what light I could on the subject. I felt flattered at having my folklore study taken so seriously and did what I could to belittle the wild, vague tales which seemed so clearly an outgrowth of old rustic superstitions. It amused me to find several persons of education who insisted that some stratum of obscure distorted fact might underlie the rumors. The tales thus brought to my notice came mostly through newspaper cuttings, though one yarn had an oral source and was repeated to a friend of mine in a letter from his mother in Hardwick, Vermont. The type of thing described was essentially the same in all cases, though there seemed to be three separate instances involved, one connected with the Winsuki River near Montpelier, another attached to the West River in Wyndham County beyond Newfane, and a third centering in the Passumsic in Caledonia County above Lindenville. Of course, many of the stray items mentioned other instances, but on analysis, they all seem to boil down to these three. In each case, country folk reported seeing one or more very bizarre and disturbing objects in the surging waters that poured down from the unfrequented hills, and there was a widespread tendency to connect these sites with a primitive half-forgotten cycle of whispered legend, which old people resurrected for the occasion. What people thought they saw were organic shapes, not quite like any they had ever seen. Naturally, 
There were many human bodies washed along by the streams in that tragic period. But those who described these strange shapes felt quite sure that they were not human, despite some superficial resemblances in size and general outline. Nor, said the witnesses, could they have been any kind of animal known to Vermont. There were pinkish things about five feet long, with crustaceous bodies bearing vast pairs of dorsal fins or membranous wings, and several sets of articulated limbs, and with a sort of convoluted ellipsoid, covered with multitudes of very short antennae, or a head, would ordinarily be. It was really remarkable how closely the reports from different sources tended to coincide, while the wonder was lessened by the fact that the old legends shared at one time throughout the hill country, furnished a morbidly vivid picture which might well have colored the imaginations of all the witnesses concerned. It was my conclusion that such witnesses, in every case naive and simple backwoods folk, had glimpsed the battered and bloated bodies of human beings or farm animals in the whirling currents and had allowed the half-remembered folklore to invest these pitiful objects with fantastic attributes. The ancient folklore, while cloudy, evasive, and largely forgotten by the present generation, was of a highly singular character, and obviously reflected the influence of still earlier Indian tales. I knew it well, though I had never been in Vermont, through the exceedingly rare monograph of Eli Davenport, which embraces material orally obtained prior to 1839 among the oldest people of the state. This material, moreover, closely coincided with tales which I had personally heard from elderly rustics in the mountains of New Hampshire. Briefly summarized, it hinted at a hidden race of monstrous beings which lurked somewhere among the remoter hills, in the deep woods of the highest peaks, and the dark valleys where streams trickle from unknown sources. These beings were seldom glimpsed, but evidences of their presence were reported by those who had ventured farther than usual up the slopes of certain mountains or into certain deep, steep-sided gorges that even the wolves shunned. There were strange footprints or claw prints in the mud of brook margins and barren patches, and curious circles of stones with the grass around them worn away, which did not seem to have been placed or entirely shaped by nature. These were, too, certain caves of problematical depth in the sides of the hills, with mouths closed by boulders in a manner scarcely accidental, and with more than the average quota of the strange prints leading both toward and away from them if indeed the direction of these prints could be justly estimated. And worst of all, there were the things which adventurous people had seen very rarely in the twilight of the remotest valleys and the dense, perpendicular woods above the limits of normal hill climbing. It would have been less uncomfortable if the stray accounts of these had not agreed so well. As it was... Nearly all the rumors had several points in common, averring that the creatures were a sort of huge, light red crab, with many pairs of legs, and two great bat-like wings in the middle of the back. They sometimes walked on all their legs, and sometimes on the hindmost pair only, using the others to convey large objects of indeterminate nature. On one occasion, they were spied in considerable numbers, a detachment of them wading along a shallow woodland watercourse, three abreast, in evidently disciplined formation. Once a specimen was seen flying, launching itself from the top of a bald, lonely hill at night, and vanishing in the sky after its great flapping wings had been silhouetted for an instant against the full moon. These things seemed content on the whole to let mankind alone. 
though they were at times held responsible for the disappearance of venturesome individuals, especially persons who built houses too close to certain valleys or too high up on certain mountains. Many localities came to be known as inadvisable to settle in, the feeling persisting long after the cause was forgotten. People would look up at some of the neighboring mountain precipices with a shudder, even when not recalling how many settlers had been lost, and how many farmhouses burnt to ashes on the lower slopes of those grim, green sentinels. But while, according to the earliest legends, the creature would appear to have harmed only those trespassing on their privacy, there were later accounts of their curiosity respecting men, and of their attempts to establish secret outposts in the human world. There were tales of the strange claw prints seen around farmhouse windows in the morning, and of occasional disappearances in regions outside the obviously haunted areas. Tales, asides, of buzzing voices, an imitation of human speech, which made surprising offers to lone travelers on roads and caught paths in the deep woods, and of children frightened out of their wits by things seen or heard, or the primal forest pressed close upon their dooryards. In the final layer of legends, the layer just preceding the decline of superstition, and the abandonment of close contact with the dreaded spaces. There are shocked references to hermits and local farmers who at some period appeared to have undergone a repellent mental change and who were shunned and whispered about as mortals who had sold themselves to the strange beings. In one of the northeastern counties it seemed to be a fashion about 1800 to accuse eccentric and unpopular recluses of being allies or representatives of the abhorred things. As to what the things were, explanations naturally varied. A common name applied to them was those ones, or the old ones, though other terms had a local and transient use. Perhaps the bulk of the Puritan sellers set them down bluntly as familiars of the devil and made them a basis of odd theological speculation. Those with Celtic legendry in their heritage, mainly the Scottish-Irish element of New Hampshire and their kindred who had settled in Vermont on Governor Wentworth's colonial grants, linked them vaguely with the malign fairies and little people of the bogs and rats and protected themselves with scraps of incantation handed down through many generations. But the Indians had the most fantastic theories of all. While different tribal legends differed, there was a marked consensus of belief in certain vital particulars, it being unanimously agreed that the creatures were not native to this earth. The Penacook myths which were the most consistent and picturesque, taught that the winged ones came from the great bear in the sky and had mines in our earthly hills whence they took a kind of stone they could not get on any other world. They did not live here, said the myths, but merely maintained outposts and flew back with vast cargoes of stone to their own stars in the north. They harmed only those earth people who got too near them or spied on them. Animals shunned them through instinctive hatred, not because of being hunted. They could not eat the things and animals of Earth, but brought their own food from the stars. It was bad to get near them, and sometimes young hunters who went into their hills never came back. It was not good either to listen to what they whispered at night in the forests, with voices like a bee's that tried to be like the voices of men. They knew the speech of all kinds of men, Pentecooks, Hurons, men of the five nations, but did not seem to have or need any speech of their own. They talked with their heads, 
which changed color in different ways to mean different things. All the legendary, of course, white and Indian alike, died down during the 19th century except for occasional atavistical flare-ups. The ways of the Vermonters became settled, and once their habitual paths and dwellings were established according to a certain fixed plan, they remembered less and less what fears and avoidances had determined that plan, and even that there had been any fears or avoidances. Most people simply knew that certain hilly regions were considered as highly unhealthy, unprofitable, and generally unlucky to live in, and that the farther one kept from them, the better off one usually was. In time, the ruts of custom and economic interest became so deeply cut in approved places that there was no longer any reason for going outside them, and the haunted hills were left deserted by accident rather than by design. Save during infrequent local scares, only wonder-loving grandmothers and retrospective non-agenarians ever whispered of beings dwelled in those hills, and even such whispers admitted that there was not much to fear from those things now, that they were used to the presence of houses and settlements. And now that human beings let their chosen territory severely alone. All this I had known from my reading, and from certain folk tales picked up in New Hampshire, hence when the flood time rumors began to appear. I could easily guess what imaginative background had evolved them. I took great pains to examine this to my friends, and was correspondingly amused when several contentious souls continued to insist on a possible element of truth in the reports. Such persons tried to point out that the early legends had significant persistence and uniformity, and that the virtually unexplored nature of the Vermont hills made it unwise to be dogmatic about what might or might not dwell among them. Nor could they be silenced by my assurance that all the myths were of a well-known pattern common to most of mankind, and determined by early phases of imaginative experience which always produced the same type of delusion. It was of no use to demonstrate to such opponents that the Vermont myths differed but little in essence from those universal legends of natural personification which filled the ancient world with fauns and dryads and satyrs, suggested the Colleen Kanzari of modern Greece, and gave to wild Wales and Ireland their dark hints of strange, small, and terrible hidden races of troglodytes and burrowers. No use, either, to point out the even more similar belief of the Nepalese hill tribes in the dreaded Me-Go or the abominable snowmen, who lurk hideously amidst the ice and rock pinnacles of the Himalayan summits. When I brought up this evidence, my opponents turned it against me by claiming that it must imply some actual historicity for the ancient tales, that it must argue the real existence of some strange elder earth race, driven to hiding after the advent and dominance of mankind, which might very conceivably have survived in reduced numbers to relatively recent times or even to the present. The more I laughed at such theories, the more these stubborn friends asservated them, adding that even without the heritage of legend, the recent reports were too clear, consistent, detailed, insanely prosaic in manner of telling to be completely ignored. Two or three fanatical extremists went so far as to hint at possible meanings in the ancient Indian tales which gave the hidden beings a non-terrestrial origin. Citing the extravagant books of Charles Fort with their claims that voyagers from other worlds and outer space have often visited Earth. Most of my foes, however, were merely romanticists who insisted on trying to transfer to real life 
the fantastic lore of lurking little people, made popular by the magnificent horror fiction of Arthur Maschin. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams. Good night.